Welcome back. You're listening to Get Real with Bob and Stacy. You're joining us for our Leaders and Legends segment. Our guest today is Rachel Braun Sherl, business builder, strategic growth expert, and vagipreneur. Welcome to the show, Rachel. Thanks so much. Great to be with you. So I want to give a full background on Rachel. I've had the pleasure of meeting her at Alley to the Valley, which is a women's networking event. And she is unbelievably dynamic in a career that, in my opinion, is really hard to kind of talk about and communicate, et cetera. So Rachel has a long track record of success as a growth strategist, marketing expert, vagipreneur, which we'll talk about in a minute, what that is, and public speaker. Over her 25-year career, Rachel has grown some of the world's leading brands and businesses, as well as helped many startups achieve market dominance with a specialty in female health and wellness. As co-founder and principal of Spark Solutions for Growth, Rachel counsels a global client base, including Johnson & Johnson, Allergen, Pfizer, and Bayer. In addition, Rachel serves as a key partner for many female health startups in reproductive health, pregnancy, birth control, arousal, among others. So first, Rachel, tell us about the primary business that you do. How do you help people or businesses drive revenue, etc.? So I really focus on driving top line growth. So whether that's new businesses, line extensions, repositioning, identifying new target groups, expanding into other geographies, creating um, new versions of existing products, it's all about how do I get more customers to engage in a transaction um, with my business, whether the companies that I work with are selling products or services. I spend a great deal of my time in the world of female sexual health so think anything from reproduction, fertility, infertility, birth control, menopause, arousal. Uh, and one of the one of the reasons I love that is I've been in that space for a while. And as you mentioned, it is not something that everybody is particularly comfortable doing or talking about. And I, you know, got my stripes working in the trenches when in 2008 we, my business partner and I, saw an asset which was a product that improves arousal, desire, and satisfaction for women, and we went through the process of raising venture capital uh, when talking to lots of people about um, vaginas. Huh. And turns out not a lot of people are as comfortable as I am <laughs> talking right. about that. And what we were able to do is really bring the business part of it. You know, this is, while it's titillating, this is a business. These companies, including ours and the ones I work with now, are creating products and services that solve important problems for women. Um, not just sexual satisfaction, although that's important, um, but a whole range of other challenges that women deal with, from changing business models, like making it easier to get your monthly protection with new distribution models, um, products that stimulate arousal for women 35 plus prior to engaging in any kind of activity, uh, natural solutions to existing products, whether they're um, organic uh, lubricants and products that are made from cotton that women are putting in their bodies, the whole range of things, and just helping the companies, creating these companies, get access and be able to create a conversation and ultimately customers to buy their products. Hmm. So interesting. First of all, it seems like there's massive opportunity within the space because it seems like maybe businesses or entrepreneurs maybe avoid the space because of some of the things that you just talked about. I'm curious. Um, number one, do you have um, do you have instances where you go into a company and you have to basically replace certain members of a sales team just because they're not going to ever be comfortable talking or do you just coach them on how to be better about talking about female sexual health for example it's a great question and there are a lot of different scenarios so a lot of these companies are funded startups so they're building the team from the ground up and they tend to attract people mm -hmm. who are interested in being in that space and talking about that space so it's the exception rather than the rule that you go into a place and say, you know, this person's got to go. They're not yeah. comfortable with the space because most people are creating these organizations gotcha. right now. Yeah. That being said, when we were building our organization to sell products, it came up all the time. I mean, we would literally interview people and say, listen, 
we talk about vaginas. We're not ashamed of it. We're we're dealing with a product that solves a particular problem or improves mm-hmm. women's uh, sex lives. That's what we do here. It might be uncomfortable, but and if you're uncomfortable, then this isn't the right place for you. Right. So we always handle this by being it right out, being right out front, and it's pretty clear. It's pretty easy to see right away. I mean, we've interviewed tons of people for other companies where you know you could just tell in the conversations that they're not going to be able to get over yes sort of the titillation factor of the space and really focus on it as building a business and and one of the things you have to do that all these amazing entrepreneurs that are starting these companies are focused on is really offering a solution or a better solution to a problem that hasn't been addressed and it is a business. That means ultimately they have to get people to engage in a transaction. And if you're in the company and can't speak about it, right? You know, everybody knows the best. The best these companies have are the people running them and the people working with them who are so passionate about it. And mm-hmm. each one becomes an ambassador. So in a company in this space, there is no room for somebody who right. isn't comfortable. You know, mentioning a female body part or right. talking about menstruation or thinking about fertility and the different challenges that women face. Are most of the founders or leaders that you're working with females? Yes, the, the vast majority um, are female. And often what happens is they have dealt with a particular personal problem. Now that gets misinterpreted sometimes as mm-hmm. it's personal and emotional, but a couple of examples. You know, a woman who at the age of 21, this brilliant woman by the name of Polly Rodriguez, at the age of 21 um, was diagnosed with cancer that made her infertile. Mm -hmm. And so she had to think about her sexuality and her response and her future in an entirely different way. That experience motivated her to create a company that provides a bunch of different products and solutions to improve women's lives. Now, yeah, that's personal. But it's solving a problem that other people have. Um, and, another woman uh, that I'm working with, an amazing company, um, is ta- is, has created a new financial model for fertility. And for those folks who aren't familiar with it or haven't had to go through it, it's incredibly time-consuming. It's emotionally demanding. It's financially demanding. And she's created a new model. Well, this also came out of her two-year struggle with infertility and seeing if this happened to me, it must happen to a lot of other people. So a lot of it, a lot of these companies are based on here's a problem I've experienced and then they do their research and find out there is a huge market for other people who have these same problems. How do you find the clients that you're working with? Um, Often it's word of mouth Mm -hmm. uh, at this point, having been in this space um, for a long time, uh, oftentimes personal introductions or someone who's on the board of Mm-hmm. a different company and becomes connected to a female health company and reaches out. And I speak about this, obviously, publicly at companies, at conferences, at universities. So I I spend a lot of time saying this is what I do. If you have a problem in the space, if you're trying to build a business in this space, let me know. And, and networking like everybody else does. And, you know, I was just stunned and amazed when I met you, Stacy, about how you've taken this art of networking uh, literally to an art form. Mm-hmm. So in my space, it's the same thing. I'm talking to people who are in this space. I'm connected with investors who are in this space. I'm reaching out and finding entrepreneurs uh, who are doing interesting things who, you know, might need some help in the places where I can provide it. Right. Now, I'm curious about your speaking career, because when I met you, I said, you should be speaking in front of big groups, not even necessarily just in the space that you're known for, because you've created an art of having marketing to and having difficult conversations. And that applies to really every business, even outside of like sexual health. So what is the type of speaking that you're doing? Who hires you in general? Well, just in the way, thank you, first of all, for those kind words. And just in the way of background, the speaking was really born from a business issue. Mm -hmm. So when we were um, working on this product called Zestra, which is the one I mentioned that improves arousal, desire, and satisfaction, 99% of the outlets that we went to, whether they were online, cable, network, radio, it didn't matter, rejected us, meaning they, we said, we have money, and they said, you know, your money's no good here. We don't want to talk about this. Hmm. And we realized that if we couldn't pay for media, we were going to have to earn it. 
And that basically started a very focused and strategic PR campaign where we were talking about the disparity in men and women's advertising. And as a result of that, I did a ton of media, I did a ton of interviews, found that I liked it, found that, you know, I had a message that people were interested in. And then um, schools and universities and women's conferences and business conferences started reaching out to me. And I focused really on entrepreneurship and leadership. And as you said, creating a communication style and building difficult categories. You know, clearly this is not the only category that's hard to build. Uh, I've worked in, you know, dozens and dozens of other categories, and each one has their own challenges. The one that makes this, the challenge that makes this one more significant is that you're literally talking about a category where there's just massive societal discomfort despite how much progress we make. So, for instance, there are a couple of companies right now started by young dynamic entrepreneurs who are doing amazing things, selling tens of thousands of units. Let's say they're vibrators or or, or some other um, device that improves health or improves experience. They're selling like gangbusters. They, like we, still can't get advertising on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So I look at this challenge of building businesses in this space like I would any other sales challenge. How do you create a message? And where can you deliver it in a compelling enough way that people are going to sign up? Because my philosophy is a business that doesn't engage in transactions where currency is exchanged is just a really, really expensive hobby. So in addition to that, I have, as you mentioned, a lot of experience working for corporate clients over a pretty long career. And that combination enables me to give examples and foundational instruction across a range of experiences, working in and for large companies, working in and for small companies. Wow. Awesome stuff. Because I'll say in general, I've noticed um, with some of the female products that you see television commercials for, you look at it and you say, I absolutely know that it was a male that made that commercial because it's just ridiculous. But I think one of the things you bring to the table is just this extensive knowledge. Being a female, I think, makes it even better, like all the background that you have. Um, We only have a few more minutes left. Talk about, I know that you had created your own female arousal company, which you mentioned. What were the biggest challenges you faced building that company, and how did you overcome them? So two of them, one I mentioned was this issue around not being able to buy media. Uh, And we created a a PR campaign to get around that. The other was in 2008 when the bottom was falling out of the financial market um, and Shearson Lehman, uh, Lehman Brothers was going bankrupt and other companies were going bankrupt at the same time. Going into Silicon Valley in 2008, two women um, talking about vaginas. Right. It was really quite an interesting Uh, eye-opening experience and we had to really learn how to change the dynamics so we got past the level of discomfort you know first you start with well this is a niche business because it only affects half the population right in my math you know 50 percent of the population is not a niche that's number one yes number two a lot of the questions that were asked were really they started out what does it do for him how is it different than viagra which we had long detailed answers to but what I found was until we figured out a new approach, we never got to the conversation. So we, you know, we were not having great luck in the first two meetings we had, and we had 13 planned over two days in Silicon Valley. And, you know, as you know, they're stacked right next to each other. So you go from one meeting to another, it's a hundred foot walk. And we finally said, we're going to have to try something totally different. So in the third meeting, I happened to have a hundred dollar bill in my hand and I walked in and I, I, and it's just remarkable because I'm one of those people who does everything on credit so I can track Mm -hmm. it. I never have any cash, but this was divine intervention. And I put the hundred dollar bill on the table and, you know, venture capitalists like to bet and compete. And I said, here's a hundred dollar bill. If anyone makes a sexual innuendo that makes us uncomfortable or a double entendre that makes us blush, or you ask a question about the category that we flat out can't answer. You know, this $100 is yours. Mm -hmm. And then I paused and I said, she likes it more. She wants to have it more. Let's talk about the business model. And it took an entirely different approach and changing the energy in the room to ultimately be able to have the conversation that led to fundraising. It was an unbelievably um, 
exhausting process Mm -hmm. in the sense that it took so much work to get people's attention. But once we figured out how to change the dynamic and take out the, you know, feeling of discomfort in the room Mm -hmm. and say, listen, you know, throw it at us. We're the real deal. We're not uncomfortable. We're here to talk about a business. If you want to make jokes, we can take them. Right. You know, let's, let's get down to brass tacks. So really that was a very difficult time because fundraising in general is difficult. The time period we were doing it in was difficult, exacerbated by the fact that we're talking about something people don't want to talk about. But such a feeling of enormous accomplishment, yep. having raised money and building a company, you know, facing those odds, which awesome. were, you know, at certain points is very dismal. Awesome stuff. Where can people learn more about you? And by the way, do you have a book coming out soon? I do. I'm working on a book called Orgasmic Leadership, Mm -hmm. uh, which is really my experience building a business in this space and interviewing, you know, dozens, literally dozens of entrepreneurs creating companies that offer products and services to women and just the interesting things that they've done and the creative solutions they've come up with and the workarounds they've done to build businesses in a space that, you know, has some particular idiosyncrasies. Mm-hmm. So I'm really excited. I've met some amazing people. Some of them I had worked with previously. Some of them I got connected to. And I'm really excited and, and hope that the book provides some real solid tactical advice about what to do when you're facing challenges. It, it's not meant obviously just to be for people who are working in female sexual health. Every business, right. you're a business in real estate, every business has unique and daunting challenges. And some examples of what I did and what these 25 other people have done to overcome these challenges to provide some instruction are, here are some things you can consider. Right. You know, don't start from a blank slate. Try some of these things. They've worked for other people in hard situations. They could work for you in your business. Right. Awesome stuff. Can't wait for the book. Where can people follow you now? So my website and my company is Spark Solutions for Growth. Mm-hmm. That's S P A R K Solutions for Growth, no space. Um, I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn as the Rachel Braun Sherrill. I'm on Twitter as R B Sherrill, S C A G R L. Type in Vagipreneur, my name will come up. Um, mm-hmm. Female sexual health, and uh, I'm out there talking about this and building businesses all the time. Awesome! Thank you so much for joining us today, Rachel. Thank you. Thanks so much. Great to be able to speak with you both. That's all for this edition of Get Real. Please join again next weekend for more.